We'll let you get yours out and we're going to have Kathy's. Uh -huh. There's only one thing I can't deal with, and that's a, check, a deck of cards glued together. <laughs> The past, the present, and the future walked into a bar. It was tense. <laughs> I see another one. Did you hear about the guy that froze to death at the drive-in? He went to see clothes for the winter. <laughs> You don't get it? Only the people no, that have been to the drive yet. Oh, you didn't I do, drive -in. but... How many paranoids does it take to change a light bulb? Who wants to know? <laughs> 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 All right, Kathy, finish uh -oh. us off. All right. There was a, a Mexican magician, and he was going to do a trick. And so he gets it all ready, and then he says, Uno, dos, poof, he disappeared without a trace. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <man. laughs> She's like, oh my god, that's, <laughs> that's funny. There you go. Oh, oh goodness. All right, so uh, we're gonna. I wanted to just give you guys some examples because you could probably spend your entire lifetime looking up every instance where the word good or goodness is used in reference to God's goodness toward us. So I picked a, a couple or three maybe psalms and we're just going to break down some of the words and give you guys some principles uh, on the goodness of God in those and then y'all can just continue your own journey as you see fit but after us going through the kings there was no way I was going to spend the next 10 years us going through the goodness of God and uh, so we're going to start with Psalm 4 we're going to read it in its entirety and then we'll break down some specific things out of uh, it looks like verse well I'm, I might have done all of them but it's verse uh, 1 but we'll just uh, dive in here so now this is a Psalm of David written by him, it was for stringed instruments. And it says, Hear me when I call, O God of my righteousness. You have relieved me in distress. Have mercy on me and hear my prayer. How long, O you sons of men, will you turn my glory to shame? And how long will you love worthlessness and seek falsehood? Selah. But know that the Lord has set apart for himself him who is godly, and the Lord will hear when I call to him. Be angry and do not sin. Meditate within your heart on your bed and be still. Now I thought that's interesting because that's in Ephesians. Offer the sacrifice of righteousness and put your trust in the Lord. There are many who say, who will show us any good? Lord, lift up the light of your countenance upon us. You have put gladness in my heart more than in the season that their grain and wine increased. I will both lie down in peace and sleep, for you alone, O Lord, make me dwell in safety. So I liked this one because you can tell that David is living in the tension of some people are after him, people are lying about him, people are saying things are unjust, and he is reminding himself, number one, that he's righteous because of God, which is interesting because that was pre-Jesus. So he had to have a revelation of a righteousness that comes only from God. So I think that's very interesting. But also where it says, and I just want to point this out before we dive into the meaning of the words, be angry and do not sin. Meditate within your heart on your bed. Offer the sacrifices of righteousness and put your trust in the Lord. The meditating is meditating upon Him. That's a response to anger. Also, in those times, you do have to offer the sacrifice of righteousness, meaning you're not going to become unrighteous with your words or with your actions when you're angry. So I thought that was really good, and it's also a trusting in the Lord to be your defense. So I just kind of wanted to point that out uh, real quick, uh, you know, to add a little bit more to the Ephesians. Now, we're going to look at the goodness of the Lord in a second, but the word here... So hear me when I call means to respond, to answer, to reply, but also to testify. And there's a testimony that God has about you. 
And that testimony is heaven's mindset and the identity that heaven has assigned to you. And uh, so in the dictionary, the word testify means a solemn declaration accepted instead of a statement under oath. So he decrees over us. And like you were just saying, we need to hear what he is decreeing over us in this particular season of our life and then come into agreement with it. Isn't that interesting? And then the word call is to call, to declare, to summon, to invite, and to be named. So what I like about that definition is it shows us the different ways that we can call upon Him. Sometimes we need to, to declare His goodness, declare His activity and His promise and His decree over our lives. Other times we invite Him in to be with us or we say the name of Jesus, the name that's above every name. In fact, Jesus is even above the name Yahweh, right? So we've got to... Uh, you know, consider these different ways that we can declare His Word, we can invite Him, we can speak forth His name. And then the word summon, I thought that was interesting because it felt kind of weird like thinking, you know, summoning God. You know, like you're giving Him a summons to show up. I mean, I know that we can, you know, make a demand on the promises of God, but the word summon originally means to remind. Now, it's not that God forgives, you know, the reminding is actually more for ourselves than it is uh, for him. I thought it was interesting in the passion it says, you know, answer me when I cry for help. And so whenever I was in distress, you enlarged me. And then that word means you created room for me. Oh, that's, I need to pray this one over uh, me and Ken's inheritance. That way no one can take it. Um, that's very good. Enlarge us. Now, where he calls him God of righteousness, it's Elohim Sadiq. Is that how you say it? Uh, I've heard a lot of people use that word, but I can't remember. Righteousness means a right relation, uh, relation to an ethical or legal standard. So kings, judges, and leaders, they were to execute their duties based on righteous standards, which David was doing. So the psalmist is recognizing that God is the source of righteousness, that he is his righteousness, revealing he has a revelation of that that wouldn't be uncovered until the Lord came. And like you said in the Passion, so you've relieved me in my distress. And the word relief means to enlarge, to extend, to open wide. That's the opposite of the word distress. So anytime any of us have been in any type of distress, you feel constricted. Things are narrow, right? And even you don't have a lot of room when it comes to your mental state or your emotional state. You have to really guard it and protect it within the confines of the word. And so that's exactly what distress means. It's a tightness, uh, at misery even, a narrow space and not wide. So it's in a figurative sense, it's a person's pain, oppression, or feeling hemmed in on all, all sides. So... The, the psalmist is saying, God took me out of the narrow and placed me in a wide area of strength, enlargement, and relief. Now that tells you the end result of any difficulty or distress you're going through should be enlarging. There should be an enlargement of your life. You should come out walking in more of the promises of God. Your soul should be enlarged to carry more joy. Uh, all your circumstances should come out even better than when you first entered into that narrow place. Because it's in the narrow place where you make a decision to trust in the goodness of God or to believe the voice of the enemy. That's the purpose of it. So also, when the Lord is blessing a time of uh, narrowness, the whole purpose of it is so that you come out with a testimony, so that you come out enlarged in a, a more of a capacity for joy. And as we learn in James, patience will have its perfect work. So it's a proving of your character and a proving of your trust in the Lord. The enemy does it to cause you to fall. So we don't want to give the enemy any, you know, room to have a testimony over us, right? Now, have mercy on me and hear my prayer. 
uh, here the psalmist is putting a direct request on the favor of God. He's asking him to display gracious acts toward him. But I like the word for hear. This word means to hear with understanding. So, I mean, I, if you have a busy mind, you can relate to this. You'll ask a question, and then they'll answer you. And <laughs> later you're like, what did you say? Because <laughs> your mind is so busy that it's not actually hearing with understanding, right? So there's a difference between listening and hearing. And for me, hearing with understanding is you're taking in what's not being said, you're taking in the response, you're reading between or hearing between the lines. But it's also the one that's used in hear, O Israel. Okay? So he's, he's he, basically the psalmist is requesting, now this is crazy, because when you have the word hear, it also means to hear with the mindset of obeying. Right? So the psalmist is obviously not requesting that God be obedient to him. You know, that would be silly. But he is asking him to listen with understanding to his plea. So that's a type of prayer here where you, you have to have God intervene or you're going to be in big time trouble. It's also uh, the idea for God not to be deaf to his weeping, but to take heed to the turmoil his servant uh, was in. Now, you don't use weeping and manipulation to get God to respond. You don't need to do that. But it is where it's like, this is the distress I'm feeling, and I ask for you to intervene on my behalf. Now, what's making him mad or distressed and upset is, how long, O you sons of men, will you turn my glory to shame? So the, uh, the, the word shame means embarrassing. And then, of course, glory is honor, uh, majesty and wealth so something embarrassing was being said about David and they were also lying they were loving worthlessness and seeking falsehood now this is interesting because worthlessness that was one of the words that were used was used for the sons of Belial <coughs> so these were pagans that were going after David and uh, the word worthless is emptiness vanity a delusion it stands for an imagined plot or plan that is a delusion. So in other words, these men love delusion. Now does that sound familiar? Where we can't decide what a female is or what a male is. Recession is no longer, you know, what uh, they're saying it is. I mean, every word is being diluted into a deception and they think we're that stupid. Now some people are. I don't know if y'all saw the post on Facebook that I shared, I believe Dorena shared it, of the farmer, you know, farming, and the girl said, you know, well, we can just go to Kroger and get soy soybeans and oil, or corn, you know, and it's like, so it's those times when I see things like that, I'm like, can America be saved, right? Can America be saved? But there's more of us than there is them. Now, uh, these men love delusion. They sought out falsehood, which means obtain and falsehood is a lie, a deception, a non-truth that's unequivocally presented as ant antithetical to God. So this means that instead of these people seeking truth, they were seeking lies and deceptions. Anything that was contrary to God, we saw the best example of this in what they did to Jesus. They shamed him, they embarrassed him, they went after his reputation, and they also sought out false witnesses which was against the, the law. So the law experts went and found false witnesses, which, by the way, if we remember from our study, is what drew the line in the sand for Jezebel. And that is what ended up in her being eaten by dogs. And sure enough, Caiaphas was crucified upside down, I believe. Uh, Annas, the high priest, was filleted alive. So that was their red line right there. So God doesn't like liars under oath at all. Uh, so, um, and again, we can see the same thing happening today. Now, the next part that the Lord has set apart for himself, those who are godly in the Lord will hear, uh, it means, uh, but no. The word no means to know, learn, perceive, discern, and consider. So, David is saying that these men would do well to know and discern that Yahweh has separated for himself a godly man. 
a man that he listens and understands when he calls out to him. The word godly, which I thought was interesting, means kind, benevolent, merciful, and pious. It carries the idea of faithful kindness and piety that springs from mercy. It also refers, and this is my favorite definition, to those who reflect the character of God in their actions and personality. So that, to me, is really neat. Because like godly, you would think, you know, they're not sinning or they're following the law and things like that. But even in the New Testament, by the way, godly doesn't mean that. Uh, godly has the same idea of a virtue and a piety toward God. And piety, if I'm not mistaken, I studied it years ago, but it's where you're committed. You're in a committed relationship with the Lord, and so your life and everything about it is seeking Him. Uh, let's see. The word denotes those who share a personal relationship with the Lord, the state of one who fully trusts Him, and then those who manifest the goodness or mercy of God in their conduct. They're examples and mediators of His goodness and His faithfulness. Now, it's interesting, because David could have said, Know this, you wicked, evil men. I'm God's kid, and you better not mess with me or he's going to come after you. But no, his response was, I am going to display the goodness and the faithfulness of God even to those that are seeking falsehood and are deceptive. So you can imagine this section right here really, I mean, when you consider all the nonsense that's going on in government, I'm like, okay, this is like a prescription for people that have a high justice core value to all the nonsense and the stupid stuff that's going on uh, in our politics today. All right, be angry and do not sin. The word anger is a level of anger that causes you to shake, to tremble, to agitate, to disturb, to rage, and to provoke. Now, sin, of course, is to miss the uh, mark or to lead into sin, but it also indicates failure to do what is expected. So, now, that's important because that takes us over into, I believe, either Romans or 1 Corinthians, where if it's a sin to them, then it's a sin. You know, so eating meat that was sacrificed to idols, if you bless it, it doesn't matter. But for those that are weaker in their faith, if they eat it, it's a sin. That's what this is talking about. So if you put an expectation on yourself and then you violate that expectation, for you it's a sin. So that's why it's so important to make sure that the expectation you're putting on yourself is actually one that is in the Word right but on the other side of that if someone believes that something is sin and you know it's not you don't then use your freedom to cause them to feel bad or to feel shame or sin instead you adapt yourself to them does that make sense yeah and I think sometimes we get a word from God and then we just kind of turn our back or you know um, explanation of it away or, mm -hmm. well maybe it wasn't God maybe this maybe yeah. that and we don't act on the word we have and I think that's probably that's good it right too there. yeah because that is missing the mark if he gives you a prophetic word and you're not walking in that word or at least contending for it then it is missing the mark that's good that's really good and another side note is don't put your expectations that God has put on you on other people I remember years ago, a lady felt like, you know, watching TV was a sin. And I'm like, well, that may be a sin for you, and I'm not sure why, but it's not a sin for me. So I'm going to have a TV. In fact, I'm going to have two. <laughs> you know. So you got to be careful because a lot of times we think, well, my expectations should be your, yours, and that's actually pride. I mean, it's ridiculous. And a religious spirit. Okay, now in Ephesians 4.26, you know, where Paul quoted this verse, the idea behind the Greek use for be angry is an intense wrath that needs revenge. Okay? So David was experiencing that on the inside. Okay? He wanted to have revenge, but he didn't want that to cause him to fail to do what God expected of him. So his job, even though he probably just wanted to kill everybody that was, you know, attacking him, his job was to pray and reflect the nature of God, His faithful kindness, the state of fully trusting Him, and manifesting His goodness and His mercy. That was His job. Uh, and so, again, if you have a high justice value, that needs to be your first response. Now, it doesn't mean that you can't be a voice against injustice. It just means 
that to do that out of intense anger in a vengeful state is not God's will. The word meditate is vocal and inner speech. Okay, so t sometimes you just have to say, not today, devil, right? <laughs> sometimes you have to say, no, I am not going to think that. That is a lie, you know, or whatever it is. Sometimes you have to speak out loud. But also your inner speech needs to align with what the word says. So the inner speech, the reason that's important is that's what is in your heart. The heart is the heart, mind, and inner person. It's a word used to describe the fact that God discerns the entire disposition of the inner person. This is why the Amplified says, Be angry or stand in awe and sin not. Commune with your own hearts upon your beds and be silent. Sorry for the things you say in your hearts. Pause and calmly think of that. I sometimes have some thoughts. <laughs> so B still has the idea you're calming yourself. There's an absence of emotional distress and churning, and you're able to quiet and relax. Once you do that, you can then think of your response uh, to an injustice. Now, although I do think the Amplified is correct, I also think there is the idea of beholding Jesus. You know what I mean? Uh, thinking of Him, thinking how He would respond. One thing that I taught years ago when I would teach on offense was that the Lord never violated or offended people based on personal freedom. He never did that. He would offend, though, based on truth. Okay, so like I was telling you guys Friday, you know, uh, does a, have you ever heard of a commander that goes out to battle without having a plan to win? You know, that was a direct dig at Antipas. So he would say things that would get under, you know, the chinks, get under the armor of people. He did have political speech, but everything he said is what he heard Holy Spirit say. So it didn't come from a place of unrighteousness or unrighteous anger. It came from a place of Holy Spirit saying it. Well, in truth, offends. Yes, it does. I mean, I don't know that he said it to offend. Yeah. But just the fact that it was truth yep. offended people. Well, and even like, um, I, it might have been Tiberius, I can't remember, no, it was Herod, it might have been Herod Antipas actually, where it says, uh, did you expect to see some reed blowing in the wind? And the word reed was uh, a direct hit again on him because his symbol on coins was reed. So over and over he would say stuff, but like you said, it's not uh, to offend its truth. He's like, I'm not a reed. I'm not going to go with the sway of the people here. I'm not political. I'm going to tell you the truth. A great example of this, I can just picture Peter's face, which by the way, they found Peter's house in Capernaum. The story where um, they dug up the thatch to let the paralyzed, that was Peter's house. And it's on an intersection of like a north and south, east, west road. And there was, sure enough, a huge courtyard. He was actually probably pretty darn wealthy. And there was a courtyard, and, and then that street, they would align them up on the streets. And it later became one of the first house churches, and later they built a church on top of it. They converted it to a church building. Um, but <laughs> Peter gets asked, do you guys pay temple taxes? Of course. Yeah. And he runs to Jesus, do we pay temple taxes? <laughs> and so the Lord's like, well, I don't know. He's, he's messing with them a little bit. I mean... You know, should the son that owns a house pay taxes to his own house? House, I bet Peter's like, oh no, because you never knew what Jesus was going to do, right? He's like, well, so as to not offend them. So here we have, he's like, you know, this is not something that I need to do to stir up even more trouble, right? So let's go ahead and pay our taxes even though I own the house, you know. I could just picture Peter like, oh no, his stomach dropping. Okay. Now, offer the sacrifices of righteousness and put your trust in the Lord means that your actions will be right and just, uh, which will be as a sacrifice, especially when you'd rather punch someone in the face, right? <laughs> you would rather let them know what you think of them. Uh, now, the ability to offer such a sacrifice is sourced in you trusting God. That's really important 
because we have to trust ourselves to the one to whom vengeance is repaid, right? He's the one that will handle that. But that does not mean that you're supposed to be a punching bag for someone to abuse you or that you cannot speak out against political injustice. That's not what that's talking about. But it does mean whether you say something or don't say something, you do it source from a trust in the Lord to have your back. Okay? So I like to say that because it's really important. Um, the ability to offer such a source or such sacrifice is sourcing your trust, which means that you have a feeling of safety and security that is felt when you can rely on someone or something else. In addition, this expression can also relate to the state of being confident, secure, and without fear. Isn't that good? In Romans 12, 17 through 21, it says, Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do, give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For by so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not overcome, be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. That actually, that principle turned gossip, uh, gossip that was being said about me around. Um, there was a situation where, uh, and Roberta's very familiar with it, where I was being uh, talked about. And I had, I think we had just launched Healing Rooms. And there were some people that were going to help with the healing rooms uh, from Bertalis. And then I was gossiped about. <laughs> and all of a sudden they were like, oh, no, we can't. You know, she's a harlot. She's a this. She's a that. Blah, blah. Well, anyway, <clears throat> I was part uh, at, uh, Aztec abstract and title. I get a phone call from the lady who had the home group that she was a part of where I was spoken about. And it was a trusted source as well. Uh, that had said that and uh, so she told me I said okay thank you and so I'm sitting there and I'm like well that sucks and I said well Lord there's really nothing I can do about it you told me to be quiet you said you'll be the lifter of my head in honor I'm not going to worry about it well anyway fast forward I don't know how long it was it might have been a few weeks or a year or so I don't know I was working at the master's books and gifts and the lady who had spoken about me came in and I had no guile there was no malice in me and she could only check out with me. And so I said, you know, how are you doing? You know, heard that her daughter had had a baby. How are her, her and the baby doing? You know, and she said, well, she's had some issues. And she described the specific issues. I said, oh, I was just reading about some essential oils that will help with that. Because she was like basically bedridden. I said, let me get you some samples. I'll make a card and I'll bring it tomorrow. And you come in and we'll get her fixed up. And she's looking at me and she said, okay, thank you. And I said, sure. And uh, so then I get a call from the same lady that called me about the, the gossip. And she said, I wanted you. I, she said, I don't know what happened. And I never told her. She said, but she came back the next week and said she was wrong about you and apologized for gossiping. And I just wanted you to know that. And I said, thank you very much. That is this. Now, that wasn't anything in me. Mike can tell you, you know, Actually, if you go after our kids or Mike, I, I probably, I might still box. Hopefully I've grown as a person. But, you know, for me, it's not as bad. But at that time, I definitely could have been one without the power of the Holy Spirit to let them know what I thought about it, right? And it really kind of depended on the day. <laughs> Some days it's like, Lord, I pray I do not see this person at Walmart because if I do, I'm going to let them have it. You know, like that's how I was before I leave the house. <laughs> All right, now, the next part is, there are many who say, who will show us any good? Lord, lift up the light of your countenance upon us. Good is the same word we've been studying. When things are tough, you can begin to wonder if you'll ever experience God's goodness again. I remember when I was sick, that's how I felt. I was like, am I ever going to feel good? Am I ever going to be able to go out and enjoy the sun and enjoy time with my friends? I mean, it was so hopeless during that time. But David's prayer, and this is a key to the goodness of God, was for him to lift the light of his countenance to shine upon the people of God. The word countenance means a face. 
Most of the time, in a figurative sense, it means the entire person, or it can be a reflection of the person's mood or attitude. So God is clothed in light. That's a manifestation of His splendor. Light is always a positive symbol of good fortune, victory, justice, righteousness, guidance, deliverance, etc. So the light of one's face expresses the favor. It's a turning of a person toward that person with the idea of doing something good for them. Okay? It's God's good mood shining on you. By the way, He's very happy. Okay, so it's his happiness impacting you. Uh, he wants to share all of those good things with us. So to be godly is to share his character, meaning that intense wrath outside the scope of his timing for it is not a reflection of his character. So that's what he's talking about. There are times when he wants to show his favor. That's not a time to show his wrath. There's other times where he's like, that's it. I'm going to handle this. And even then you're like, no, Lord, because you said this, this, and this. So if you do that, it'll actually make you look like you're not a good God. And then other times we have to come into agreement with his wrath and actually pray it in. But here's the deal. We've done this before. You don't want to have any anger in your heart toward that person. Okay? Or any unforgiveness. Because if you release that judgment against them and you have that, it will actually come back on you according to Matthew chapter 18. So you want to be really careful. But know that he's very slow to anger, which we're often not. And that's why we have to make sure that we're not expressing anger when he is not. Okay? And then, of course, we'll have the day of the Lord, which is when his full entire wrath will be poured out, which is unimaginable. No one's going to be able to figure that out until we see it. So he uh, will release judgments meant to turn hearts back to him, of which we must long for and agree with. But any agreement and execution of his judgments must not be from anger or vengeance, or to reflect his faithfulness, kindness, and goodness. All right. You've put gladness in my heart more than in the season that their grain and wine increase. The word put means that God has placed something in the psalmist, and it's gladness. Gladness is joy, rejoicing, gladness, and pleasure. It refers to the reality, the experience, and manifestation of joy and gladness, and the celebration of something with joy and cheerful activities. So where we might feel anger, He wants to put gladness in you. Isn't that good? You know, and listen to the people around you. When, uh, you know, Mike's been working really hard on Dad's house, and... Uh, yeah, I didn't want him to, you know, he just, he works. That's what he does. I, I want to be helpful. You know? So I go there that night and, uh, you know, start going through some things and stuff. And um, and then I, I find, you know, the cat bed. You know, my dad's cat ran over. And Mike said something. He said, there, there's tragedy here. Maybe you need to stay away for a bit. Listen to those voices. Because I could hear Holy Spirit on it. And I'm like, you know what? I think you're right. I think that's what I need to do. So I was very intentional on working. I would.